And we are live. Hello, everyone. Happy International Cat Day, August 8th. <laughs> you didn't Rob tell Rattay. me that. Yeah, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> I had no idea. I don't think we give International Dog Day enough celebration, but um, okay. Today, yeah, today, you know, the internet has preferences, so, you know, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> the so, internet is for cat videos. Yeah, today we have Josep from Mender. Hello, Ooh, everybody. Thanks for having me. Update topics. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thanks for inviting me, Jason, Rob, and Andre. Um, what's what's customary here? A short introduction on myself, or do we do uh, go around to everybody? But I guess everybody knows you already. Yeah. So tell us about yourself. Tell us what you do at Mender. Tell us what Mender does. Okay. So um, I also have a small surprise for you because I like revenge. And I actually have been with Beagle way longer than uh, at least you, Andre, because many years back, to be very exact, in 12 years back, also in Prague, there already was an ELC in, in Europe. And I was there when members of the very first like small Beagle community were showing around the first prototypes of the Beagle bone white under the tables already so i've in fact been with the beagle community for many many years yeah i had a lot i had a sh longer gap in between so um for a proper introduction to uh introduction now introduction now uh, my name is joseph joseph holzmar um i'm with uh, mender i'm serving as head of developer relations like i said i have a very long history in embedded linux especially in the Beagle and TI community because that's where it all started for me with a Beagle, uh, Beagle Bone White and the Panda board. Actually, I still have a couple of those um, over there in my drawer. From there, it took me through uh, many years of industrial controls, uh, embedded Linux, and from there into the Yocto ecosystem where I became a also quite active community person. I grew into an ambassador. By now, I'm serving also as community manager. So. I kind of like do what I always do. I try to make people happy, both for Mender with OTA solutions, both uh, with Yocto, with building their systems, and with Beagle in order to give them a super maker-friendly board. Hello, everybody. Awesome, awesome. This is Jason. I'm a little. I'm Robert and I are faceless today, unfortunately. But um, yeah, the, the the original Beagle Bone. I I have a lot of affinity for that board. Um, you know, the first Altoids Mint Tin, the precursor to oh, yeah. the you know that that fruit board that ever you know you hear a lot of talk about, right? Where they You're forgot to it. round the corner so it doesn't fit in the Mint Tin. Um, you know, that kind of copied the outer dimensions of that 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 bone colored board, right? That's actually kind of you know, the bare bones beagle board, right? We kind of stripped down the original beagle board and, you know, made that, that first beagle bone. I have a lot of love for that board, but um, we don't talk about Panda. <laughs> oh, pandas are lovely. They are so, so cuddly. <laughs> we don't talk about Panda, which was, which was not okay. a beagle board, which was not a beagle board project. Do not confuse Panda uh, okay. with beagle board. There was a lot of TI people involved okay. with it too. And there's a lot of yeah. working together, so. But there was, there, there was, we kind of said this is the right <laughs> way to do it, and they chose a different way, and uh, they they had an incredible chip, um, but you know that longevity, right, of the availability and things that we were looking for, the accessibility and longevity wasn't there. And <laughs> well, you can still buy pad as brand new in the box. Okay. Seriously, I, yeah. I actually, I actually, I actually, I. <laughs> I actually would word it the exact opposite way because they had a, a chip that, um, to be honest, 10 years after, I can say that totally sucked for the community. <laughs> let, let, let's be honest, a chip that you can buy unless you, you take a million and that you can only right. actually put to work with super expert uh Terminal management, that, that's not maker friendly. And that's why it's, it's not 10 a years after. Board. I can't say it now. <laughs> Perfect, man. That's why it's not a beagle. Yes. <laughs> Do we have to cut that out later? <laughs> Andre shakes his head no. He says it quietly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think 
I think we 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 started out on the right foot. It's time to have a beer <laughs> by now. No, Seriously, that's kind of one of those cheers, things everybody. We learn from all, you know, like hmm? our, all our buddies' mistakes. Like, okay, these are things you should do, should not do. And so, like going forward, it's like, okay, we must do this. So, you know, it's a learning process. Um, yes, and and to hook on that, this is actually like the prime reason why I'm doing what I'm uh, doing now these days both with the Octo and with Mender, because it's so hard, and uh, Robert probably knows it from, from the, the Debian word, world, it's so hard if everybody reinvents the wheel all of the time, and everybody says like, oh, I've got this, it's, it's super easy, it's just, just like these three lines of bash script, what, what can go possibly go wrong, I'll just crank it up, uh, I don't look at existing solutions, and that's what happens whenever somebody wants to customize Debian, what, whenever somebody wants to customize Yocto, and whenever wants to do over the air uh, in, their, in their home basement, and I guess you all can, can tell the tales of everybody who has gone wrong in that time and that's what i always preach to people don't reinvent the wheel because every every small and tiny it's it's just these three lines homebrew solution usually just like explodes in your face and turns into a massive time sink that's at least my experience and feel to free be, to disagree no to be clear we're all probably guilty of that right we've all reinvented the wheel at least you know a couple of times <laughs> and that's why I love putting Debian on all these things. You could just go to the package report mm -hmm. and like, okay, what has someone already reinvented and can I use it? You're like, oh, I can just app install. Mm -hmm. And so, example, we were talking about the Mender client. Oh, there you go. It's right in Debian. I can install it. I don't have to report it, move it from Yocto. It's there. Yes. And if you are trying it, just as Jason did half an hour ago, then you will probably say, oh, my God, what uh, did Joseph tell me? That it is so super easy to uh, to use <laughs> because he ran right into the fa first caveat <laughs> after like two minutes. And yes, um, so if you do that and if you type up install Mender client. Yes, this will get your board right up to speed uh, to uh, to connect to the Mender backend. But please, if you do it, use a user and password account because the single sign-on solutions, um, they are meant for big fleets. And by big fleets, I mean like a couple of thousands because they don't give you a user password combination and then you can't connect the client directly. I'm really sorry for that. It's it's like an architectural issue that we keep on running into sometimes. Usually it's not a big problem because most of the fleets are actively managed. But if you're a maker, I care for makers, um, then please keep this in mind right from the beginning. Save you this one hour of your life where you are screaming about me. <laughs> yeah, so I was able to install the the Mender client super super easy. Um, you know, run Mender setup. Um, but yeah, that because I had created my account using GitHub, which I thought, oh, that just makes things easy. I don't have to remember another password. I didn't have a password when it asked me for one, so I haven't quite been able to yeah. get it connected up to the server yet. But um, um, I'm going to create a new account later and and get that working. Um, because I'm I'm excited about using it, but um, yeah, you know there was I want I, I want to go back to um, ELCE in 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 Prague um, this last um, last month, right? Because it was really cool, you know, meeting you face to face, and you had one of the funnest Beagle Play demos um, up and running, yes, thank right, you. on the Octo project, right? So you know every mm -hmm. device must run doom right <laughs> it, it is <laughs> every device must run doom and that that was the that was the topic for the octa booth there yes we said whoever can bring a device that runs doom we will put it on the table and i was like oh i've got this uh, beagle play and i'm going to make it run doom so i did all day long and actually we even have a video of it because I know I'm I'm riffing a little bit back to Yocto, sorry, um, but I did also present about how to put Doom on it, and it's somewhere in the interwebs in the in the YouTube playlists already. How I did make it work back then, and what I did not make work 
so I, I think, of, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily know, because you talk about doing things the, the, the right way, right? I think when you're there at the, the Octo booth, right, you're, you're very much, you know, representing reproducible builds, you know, software bill of materials. Um, you know, we ship Debian and we ship real Debian, not Begian or, you know, whatever, you know, right? We ship, we ship Debian on our boards because it's just so easy to find instructions on the internet to get things set up, like pseudo app install mender client, right? <laughs> it's just, mm, it's, yep. it's just that easy. Um, but there really is a reason why people run um, Yocto. And, you know, I think it's important for the Beagle community that, that we continue to support that. Um, in order to make a certain class of projects. So so why do people run Yocto? Yeah, um, thanks for the kind words. And I actually have to have to thanks, uh, thank you and rephrase a little bit. Yes, I riff a lot about Yocto and doing things the right way. But what I mean to say or mean to convey is, is the right way for the use cases I usually care about. And when I say the use case I care about, then 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 does not this does not mean that this is this is the use cases that everybody should care about. Everybody has their own use cases, and that's why I also think. And uh, now the Yocto people, please uh, bless me, um, that shipping Debian as the default is definitely the right solution for the Beagle Play because. As you said, it is super maker friendly. You can just plug it in and you can do apt install, whatever, including Mendo client, um, because it gives you a very hands on and iterative way of doing things. This is super valuable for the, the, the maker type, for the getting started type, for prototyping, for all of these kinds. I completely agree that Debian is the perfect choice and I wholeheartedly uh, support shipping it as the de as the default for all of the Beagle um, family. The the difference to Yocto is as you said it's um, reproducibility it is software bill of materials it is license tracking all of those things if you do if you do need those things because you have a fleet that consists of a thousand devices of 10k devices maybe even of a million of devices then um it is probably not a very good way of maintaining things to grab the latest debian image from beagleboard.org to install it to have a fancy list of apt install is, uh, instructions and then put this config file here and then do this and then do this and then do this because that inserts a lot of like um, non-reproducibility. If you do apt install, you get whatever is in the repositories at that very one moment in time. You don't know 10 minutes earlier what you will get. With Yocto, you do. If you are a maker, or a are just doing things for an internal um, project or whatever, and then you can have this very quick and easy and inter iterative way of making things work right for you away, and you don't care if you get version um, one point three point eight or one point three point eight point one because there has been like a minor bug fix possibly. But if you are shipping things out and you are um, required to prove all your license compliance and you need to provide a software bill of materials and you have to uh, be able to, um, to show this for each and every re release, which means each and every device that you shipped, not just the, the releases that you have on your mental model, but really each and every device that leaves your house, then you need the powers that Yocto can give you. To me, it's not a one is the better. It is a both have good use cases and use the right tool for the right job. Um, we, we we just before we had this uh, this conversation, we were talking about the back channel and how yeah. some people are discussing things. And one thing I I said was um, a lot of people have the mindset. If the only tool you know is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. And I always keep on telling people, expand your toolbox. Know a lot of tools so you can 
pick the best tool for the job. Pick Debian when you need something that Debian can give you. Pick Yocto if some if you need something that Yocto can give you. And if you need something that Mender can give you, then please pick Mender. Don't yeah. pick any of those three if you don't need it. <laughs> that that is my main message, yeah. really. <laughs> you know, I look at I look at Build Root as well, which is one I love, which mm -hmm. is one I'm spending a little bit of time with now trying to get that up on, on, on Beagle Play. Um, but when I looked at, at, at Mender, Mender is a hammer that I really want to add to my, my toolbox, right? I mean, Yocto, you know, was kind of there, right? We use Yocto and we need to use Yocto for, for different things, right? But, um, you know, Mender is a, a very new tool for me. Um, but it's one I want to add to my toolbox because I think there's some really interesting aspects for people in the Beagle community, um, you know, I'm 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 a an everyday user. You know, this is the this is the open source world. Like we can speak of everything, right? I I'm a regular user of Belina, and I really I really love Belina. Mm -hmm. Use it to manage Yocto, um, um, you know, devices and and Docker containers. But you know, sometimes I just I don't need all of that. You know, I just want you know some over the air updates. Um, we kind of got you know because mm -hmm. you're just right there in. Um, Debian, we could easily install the, the Mender client, get something managed, um, you know, with a handful of steps. And it, it, it also kind of, you know, maybe, maybe this is turning a little bit of, uh, you know, um, yeah, everything's a nail. But, I, but, I, but we kind of brainstormed a little bit over the last couple of days about some possibilities of things that we could do with Mender if we made a minimal Mender image. Um, for something like Beagle Play, right? So you could really try out these other distros, try out Yocto, try out, um, you know, essentially like net install, but 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 not quite net install, right? You you look at just doing a managed um, um, release. I don't know if I can how to put that quite in better terms, right? But how did how did you see that that brainstorming over the last couple of days that's going on in the back channel? <laughs> yeah, I I personally think it's it's a very cool idea. It's um, it requires a little bit of technical tinkering, of course. Um, so my understanding is that yes, it is a very valuable idea because if we have that, it would enable to use users to fearlessly try out all of the distros. They can just say, okay. Um, let, let me try out Debian, install it, break it, reinstall it. Or, oh no, Debian doesn't feel like it for me today. Uh, today I want to do uh, Arch Linux. And then you install Arch Linux without going through all of these hoops and jumps that they sometimes require. And, and if you are happy with it, then you stick with it. And if not, then you just switch to something else. And yes, this is something that the Mender client can do. And I've also, as you said, brainstorming, I've started looking into it a little bit. The way I personally would do it is um, create a fairly small rescue image, probably even bundled with the kernel as an init RMFS. And as you are also, um, let's say, traveling towards the UEFI world, it could be just be there in, in, the, uh, in the boot selection. And then, they, then you say, Give me the rescue image, which holds all of these mechanisms. And then you could install an image from either um, some HTTP uh, uh, location or from, your, um, from a thumb drive or whatever. This can definitely be done. This is, this is one of the things where the Mender client really shines because it is so extremely payload agnostic. In in conversations and now also on the internet conversations that are recorded for my own bad, uh, I usually okay. refer to us as a software logistics company because what we really know about is how to move something that is a software thing from A to B. And A to B can mean your thumb drive onto your flash for example, or your deployment server onto your flash or whatever. And we really do not care 
how the distribution looks like, or if it, if we are shipping containers, or if we are just shipping um, some assets for a website, or if we are shipping assets for a navigation system or an AI model, whatever. If you can put it into an artifact, as the the common term is, then we can we can ship it and put it on your device. And this is this is essentially the the part of the mentor client that could and should be harnessed for this type of thing. Yeah. As I said, I've just like started evaluating a little bit. I think it can be done, but it's not I, quite there yet. I'm, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think the possibilities are, are super cool. I'm going to try to pull Robert back into the conversation because Robert and Andre have been working mm -hmm. over the last couple of weeks. We, Robert's new August 5th release, I think, just went out. I think it had some, some bootloader updates. Um, but but they've been working on some stuff completely parallel or orthogonal or however whatever different than this right just different stuff <laughs> but, but but also just kind of you know making those iterative improvements on the boot environment and on um, you know what does recovery look like right so how how can we mm -hmm. continue to drive um, the, you know, for, for Beagle, it's right. The best out of box experience in the world. Right. So for, for any developer, just be able to pick up a board and start developing in minutes and, and, and switch up what they're doing, right. Do different things, right. Recover from different situations. And, and Robert and Andre, I don't know if you can talk at all about what you've been doing over the last week. Um, with the um, with the bootloader and finally putting in <laughs> finally putting in some boot menus for for uh, for once. I mean, Robert's solution is great. Basically, what happened is I was messing around with Beagle Play. I loaded the wrong device tree file in ext Linux, and all of a sudden my board's not booting. Right, so I can get to uBoot, but nothing else. The second I try to boot, what do I do? Right, so I was familiar with like you know like the old way of doing things, which you know you look at your environment variables, you do a print end, you try to remove all the crap that you messed up, and then you rescue yourself, but I was, you know, it's it's gotten so complex now with the XT Linux that it's kind of hard to debug. So I basically go on Discord, ping Robert, and go, all right, what's the right way to do this? Because <laughs> my obvious thing was, all right, I'll pop in an SD card, boot, boot off the SD card, and then edit the what's on the EMMC. But that just sounds like a convoluted way, and you know, X number of steps versus what's a good solution. So Robert was like, well, he would support menus now. I'm like, what? And that's kind of the power of XT Linux is that there are so many unwritten or on you know their goal was to basically look, make it look like grub and all the config options and we just were never taking advantage of any of it and so yeah i run into the same problems well i just reflash the image call it good but for our end users like let's find a way they can actually have a menu pop up and they can choose a different option and kind of going forward if you look at mainline uboot the skam62 board actually has frame buffer out so in the next let's say year maybe we might be able to show uh <laughs> basically a bios window on the play year we have Come hdmi on. keyboard Woo. support you can actually go up and down and menu year. so this and it all uses the x to linux commands anyway so we're kind of setting the groundwork for oh uh beagle play bios and then the uefi people <laughs> be happy yeah and so that was the other well, thing well we <laughs> uefi and happy in one sentence i think that's a little bit far-fetched but <laughs> i mean the fact that yep. we I mean, we could be running UEFI now, and 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 I don't know what it what I, I I personally don't know what it takes to try to get frame buffer stuff running in the UEFI um, code that, so they could run a, a you know a nice grap graphical version of of, of Grub, um, right? But you know, it seems like Grub is something that already does run well, right? Grub itself, right? Without the graphical portion. Um, that that's actually a good question. I so it's. I didn't realize that this until an hour ago, that um, Debian goes straight for, from U-Boot, whereas the Yocto build, as uh, Nishant has prepared, actually uses U-Boot to grab to Linux. So whenever I looked at my newer Beagle boards, um, which means the AI64 and the Beagle Play, um, I would instantly see uh, the grub menu. I'm not sure if I was seeing it on the display or only on the terminal. But that that might also come from the fact that I hardly ever look at the at the display, and most of the times I don't even have it connected because, yeah, you know, I'm, I work on system level stuff. Um, but 
the uh, grub is there, and I think it can use the um, the frame buffer at least, and can use the keyboard. Or it, no, it is there, and it uses the keyboard, and then from there. So you basically, if you use the default Yocto build as prepared, then uh, you already have the grub boot menu. I'm not sure how this translates to EXT Linux because then I'm out of my knowledge. Right. But um, I think it can't be can't be that much more complicated actually. Yeah, because the, the EXT Linux is all from the, the kind of the distro boot infrastructure and U boot, right? So mm -hmm. you know it's it's um you know set to be standardized across different boot medium right for for um you know, having the the configuration file for the the, the distros, and I'm, I'm expecting Robert to speak up when I say something wrong. <laughs> but you know, it's um, uh, you know, this is all towards this thing called um, system ready. Ultimately, I think, which is an ARM um, uh -huh. initiative, and you know, I got to speak with the uh, you know Grant Likely there, and um, I like say Grant's is he doing. He sold the arm stuff anyway. Um, yeah, I think he's Grant is Grant is back at Linaro. He's he's yeah. got a a a. Uh, hopefully, I'm not not either over or under selling him now. But I think he's got a C in front of his title now, and it takes care mm -hmm. of exactly what you just said. Yeah, at least when we right. talked last, he was very he was very um, interested in. Exactly what you just said, system ready, UFE, all of this coming together. So, so too bad indeed. Nishant's not here right now, right? But I think Nishant is actually doing a lot of the legwork and, and coordinating a lot of that to try to help us uh, get ready for system ready. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and yeah, and um, while we're at UFE and all of the system ready stuff, uh, I need to like make also one praise for Nishant here because when when you want to do like a b updates which is one of the things that mender can do this is this is like more of the standard use case in uh, in the industry what we were talking about like 10 minutes back this rescue system is like a an interesting use case but it's not the standard for us and the standard use case for mender is having AP mechanisms. So you run the client. When a, f a full system update arrives, you have two partitions. You have an active one and you have an inactive one. The system runs on the active one. The update arrives. It goes on the inactive one. Once it's there, the, um, the system reboots the bootloader. Usually, U boot flips the system partition and boots into the into the updated system. What if that boot uh, up process has completed? It is committed. The update ha has succeeded. If something goes wrong, the watchdog kicks in, or you pull the plug, or whatever. Then um, upon the next reboot, the bootloader knows, oh, I did a flip, but something went wrong because it never got committed. Then it flips back, and you go back to the um, less known good state. So you have a system that is not bricked. Here, I mentioned the bootloader. A couple of times, and why did I do that? Because the Beagle Play fam, or Beagle Play and Beagle AI 64, were the first boards that I ever worked on, where I did not have to patch the bootloader for this. Oh. Because, as we just meant, yeah, seriously, where uh, as we just talked about it, U boot, grub, UEFI, all of that. Um, you don't require this patching stuff anymore. Because if you have UEFI, then you have scripts and you don't have to tinker with the source code and everything uh, anymore. You just have the proper script inserted. It can take care of all of the stuff and it works right out of the box. So in order to have all of this mechanism ready for the Beagle Play and the AI64, I needed to write exactly zero lines of code. Nice. That's, and and that, that's but, awesome. That's exactly what you just said. Nishant is doing doing the legwork, but he's he's helping so many things, and many of those are probably not even on, on his mind because he's he's working on the lower level. He's making things work, and 
people like me can just like reap the benefit of that and say, hey, there's Grub, there's UEFI, it just works for me. I say, have Mender installed with the Grub script and it works out of the box. And that was just like super awesome, no. seriously. No. Now, when you say works out of the box, though, what I, what I want to make a clarification on is you're really talking about building Yocto images and taking the, the meta TI layer yeah. straight out of Yocto and building images straight out of that, which, right, for people getting I know. I know. An, an AI64 or a, you know, or, or a Beagle Play, um, you know, the, the Flash is programmed with Debian and it's programmed with the version of the bootloader that isn't necessarily mm -hmm. exactly what Nishant's been working on. Right for the for the Yocto images, so I think we need to try to make sure we get that support in there because I'm not sure what the gap is, um, you know, relative to just doing that on the the, the Debian images, right? Because it, so actually, it's been kind of a little bit back and forth in Nishan. So uh, we forked their version of U-boot. Uh, the, the major patches we added was, of course, the board support, which with Nishan's help, but it was basically um, FTD overlay support and X to Linux uh, reading support. And Nishan has actually merged those mm -hmm. back. So uh, so right now we're on 22.03 and I'm planning within the next few months to jump to TI's next tree. And so we'll be ha we'll basically have the same version of U-Boot that TI is shipping in their made of TI tree. So right now it's a small patch delta for just our board support, but we've been working together. The goal is to basically use the same boot source. So I was playing with uh, the AM69 um, last week, and I just took Nishan's tree, and x Links just worked out of the box for my board. So all these things that we'd work in on the background, yep, it just works. <laughs> nice. So for end users, that means when they get a player, big on AI64, let's say the next time we update the default image from the factory, it'll basically be TI's U-Boot with their user environment support, their AV support, our x Linux support, our overlay support, and yeah. So you these can take any TI image and it'll boot. But these EFI scripts, right? Do the EFI scripts live within the fat partition, right? Is there a, a place? Yeah. Yep, so there's a special boot directory you stick in the fat partition, and that's one of the things we did in this last August release. We bumped that image size from 128 meg to 256, because we were using about 50% of that for our current init file system and kernel build. So we're trying to give more room for UFI binaries. Yeah, and I think we're also talking about maybe an init RAM disk, right, that we could use for like a, like a minimal... Um, system that could be used as like an, an updater image, right? That's also a, yep. a vision here. Hmm. Yep, or an image selector or a trial, or hey, I need to, I gotta recover this. Hmm. I lost my but, password. I need um, to mount the image and do something. <laughs> exactly. But curious question um, why is uh, the kernel and all of this stuff living in the fat partition there? Uh, we, we have a tendency for uh, end users to have a wide variety of uh, file systems. So okay. like ButterFS is now supporting U-Boot, but like things like Z ZFS mm -hmm. or other complicated OSs. U-Boot sadly doesn't support everything. Mm. So we okay. traditionally shove them into something readable. But yeah, true. If okay. you do what you're doing, you know, to the end user, if you know you're using XDF4, well, you can move it. And that's the power of the X to Linux config. You can define where these boot files are looking. So even though we're currently like installing our kernels into the, the FAT partition, all the modules are installed in the EXT partition, aren't they? Or are they not? Correct. Uh, there's an uh, init file system, and that's it. So there's the kernel, the device tree, and the, the init file system. Mm. Everything else is in the end file system. Okay. Thanks for the explanation. It's This is, like I said... I apologize. This is, this is not my my standard turf. So it's always yeah. great if I learn something again. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. That's always been kind of the fun thing is we've had a lot of people over the years, oh, I want to do this and this. And so we try to make it generic. Like another one on, mm -hmm. I've been playing a lot with the AM69 lately. Uh, both um, U-Boot currently doesn't read the PCIe or the USB SATA. So I have to jump from the, the micro SD card, which has my kernel, into the NVMe drive. And so Yubu can't scan okay. it with the current patch. So. Interesting. So, but actually, um, as we as we're with uh, SD card and EM, EMMC, um, I think this is the perfect point in time to insert old man stories, just as I am, because <laughs> during the first big big pounds, um, the default um, setup was to boot always from the EMMC. Um, 
some people still remember this. And you could uh, get rid of this in two ways. One was a jumper cable, which modified one this boot pin. So literally on every uh, big bone that I ever had, there was this jumper cable to always boot from, yeah, the, the, uh, the, from the SD card first. Yeah, because the boot pins or, used to come to the headers. I mean, yep, but no longer true on AI64. Yeah, it was basically holding yes. the button down. Yes. Yeah, you could hold that one button down also, but uh, I don't hold but down buttons over there in the rack. And the second option was, who can guess it? Wiping the boot partition. Oh, D yeah, DD zeroed out, right? That's that's been that was an, an FAQ on the forums for the longest period of time. Just <laughs> hey, just, just delete the bootloader off the UMC. You'll be you boot off of SD fine. Exactly. Exactly. I think it was fixed in A6 or what? So, like the the big one AI, the AM5 family, we changed, I think, the boot order. So it was always mm -hmm. defaulted to one over the other. So it was always micro SD card. So it was the boot ROM yeah. would do it. Which to me ultimately. But means... a lot of that too was. Was it because of the BeagleBone, the original white one? There was something, we went to the black, mm -hmm. we changed the boot order. Well, remember the white didn't have the EMMC. There was no yeah. onboard flash on the whiteboard. That got added. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, which is, I mean, the whiteboard, you, you know, the EMMC pins, like if you go to black, right, why do you have the EMMC pins taken up, right? Because that's where they were on the, the, the whiteboard we, before we put the EMMC down on the board. So um, no longer true on AI64. AI64, you have access to all the pins. None of them are taken up by the flash or the Wi-Fi or the, um, the, the the HDMI, you know, none of that stuff. So Mux all the pins. <laughs> <laughs> Advantages um, of a bigger diary, right? Where you have a bigger package, you got more pins yep. to work with. Yeah. The, the um, like I, I, I've, I don't know the, the 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 strategy of booting off of micro SD first. Um, you know, I think you know, kind of runs a little bit counter to me when you want to make an embedded product, right? You want to make a embedded product that where you have plug something in or not plug something in, it boots exactly the same way. So. For a while, we had an issue with people trying to boot off of micro SD cards um, with old versions of the U boot. Um, and th this kind of resulted in a, 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 you know, a, a configuration that was somewhat different than what they, that they anticipated. I think it usually came down to loading device trees, drive device tree overlays, or something like that. Um, and uh, so, you know, you, you had to tell people if you, uh, yes, you're booting off of the micro SD because the code on the EMMC is booting off of the micro SD, not mm -hmm. because ROM is booting off the micro SD. Um, so if you want to, and I think it was flasher images that might have had a problem with this, in fact. And so you had to hold that boot button um, to run these flasher images because you, 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 you just had versions of the bootloader that were just too old on the onboard flash. And that was kind of the fun I thing know. about U-Boot. We've gone from, you know, it just does one simple thing to now it's doing UEFI, XLNX, and it's doing overlays. So you could get away with an old bootloader for a long time, but there were so many nice features that you had to have. U-Boot is an yeah. incredibly complex, single-threaded operating system. <laughs> so, so, Yosef, yeah, how, it, how long did you run Doom is. on U-Boot? Say again, Andre? Um, Doom on U-Boot. I, I the think that actually sense. would, it shouldn't be that much of a problem actually i mean <laughs> it's it's so um how about finding some google summer of, of code student <laughs> and just having a go at it um i mean it definitely should be be possible so i mean i mean you have to to get into your brains that doom was originally written for a uh 486 which was like modern 30 years ago roughly and they clocked at a 66 megahertz if you had if you were lucky enough to have the dx2 version and had like four and if you were rich you had like eight megs of ram and it was doom also was a single threaded up uh, um, blob that just ran the whole machine back then because it was on dos so I have not looked into the Doom source code, and I don't. I have looked into the U-Boot source code, and I didn't like it that much, to be honest. But just from from the pure 
technical perspective, I don't see a reason why you couldn't have a Doom command in, in U-Boot. And to be honest, <laughs> that would be kind of cool. <laughs> well, All right, so summer, as, as, summer of Code 2024, we know what, we know what the plan is. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it, it should be the last... <laughs> Yeah, it is. It is the last. It is the last uh, step in the boot chain. I, I mean, okay, we're 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 completely off in in Dreamland now. But um, you all remember when when you have a when you have you assembled your your new desktop PC, right? And you uh, you tried to get the boot order right. And we all know that prompt that ends with with uh, BIOS searching for something PXE and then spinning, right? Let's replace that with Doom. Let's let's make yeah. the fa final stage in the Beagle U boot when it can't boot of either the SD card or the network nor the EMMC. Just play Doom. <laughs> We're gonna run a fun situation where actual deployments for Beagle, like the coffee machines and things like that, or the CubeSats. You know, they they. Some some horrible boot failure happens, and they're all just in space playing Doom. Uh, uh, there's there's already a UEFI port of Doom, so all we have to do. Is, we can run it from U boot. We just we can, we don't even have to compile it, right? We just run the UEFI version. See, and then that, that's that's where is the singularity happens. Doom <laughs> is about demons from space. You know, cube sets. Running Doom, I think it would ha it will happen, and finally the future will be here. <laughs> so I think we only have you for another ten minutes or so, Joseph, to, to yeah. bring us back. Okay, to sorry. <laughs> back from the space. <laughs> uh, that's that, that's for the the future after hour show. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but but people who have seen me live know that I always do. All of the crazy stuff on stage, and I'm um, super boring actually after hours. <laughs> so I guess what's you know we we talked about using Mender, you know, not not as a hammer for every nail. When when should people be using Mender? What do you think are the kind of deployments that make sense, both you know corporate level, but also for makers in the Beagle situation, right? When when should you be using Mender, and what benefits do you get? I'd say the um, the biggest benefit as a maker that you can have is the remote terminal because uh in mender we also have the uh, the so-called troubleshoot add-on which um you can have both on the hosted version as well as the um self-operated version and it is essentially a super fancy remote shell access with a file transfer with uh, port forwarding and all of that stuff, and it does not require you to um, to set up SSH to move any keys back and forth, and all of that stuff. It does not ha need to have an uh, uh, open port. So whenever you have the Mender client on your device and registered with a Mender server, like I said, either the one that we operate or the one that you can operate yourself, then you have a list of all your devices. And if you have enabled this Mender troubleshoot add-on or installed the Mender Connect client, which is also in the Debian repositories, then this gives you um, a direct, just open a shell here, and then you can type away and use the device just like over SSH with the nice side effect. You don't have to manage reverse SSH. You don't have to manage the keys, all of that stuff. It's right there in, in your browser. And that, I think, is super, super helpful, especially for, uh, for the maker community. Because once you, um, once you have your devices set up, then you can just like distribute them wherever. And together with the, the brick-free mechanisms, it essentially makes sure that you can always reach them, get into, into the file system, and fix, update, modify, make work, tinker, whatever. So for, for the devices over there in my rack, I usually don't SSH in, not even into the controlling uh, machine. I just have my, my Mender dashboard open and say, okay, these are the 10 devices I'm working on at the moment. Now I need to dial into that one. Give me a terminal. I'm the, right there, and that's it. And the, the beauty of it is not only the um, the lack of management; that it is only that uh, it is also that it is an always an outbound 
connection. This is the, I mean, this comes from the corporate level, but it's super useful, especially for makers, because example, you are building a tinkering thing that you're deploying to your parents house or whatever. You probably don't want to, uh, to open their Wi-Fi or uh, install port forwarding or whatever. You just want to place it there and it works. And that's what the Mender client and connect can do because they always open a port to the outside, it's an outgoing connection, and then they uh, they have the virtual terminal, the PTY, on the device exposed to you and only you in the dashboard. This is a super useful thing, especially when you are when you are working with single devices as a maker, as a tinker, as a hobbyist, as somebody who just wants to get things done. That's actually wonderful. The the obvious use case I can think of is I run Home Assistant and. Uh... Uh, and pie hole, right? And every time pie hole goes down, I'll get a I'll get a text from my girlfriend. Internet's not working. I'm at work. Sorry, I know what happened. See? DNS went down. I didn't set up a backup because I'm bad. <laughs> See, you should have the Mender client installed on your pie hole because then you could always dial in, unless you have a power outage. But I mean, Mender can do a lot of things, but it cannot fix your power supply. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> awesome. I, I might I might actually use this as a as a business idea. Mender power, ment power. I like it. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Go chase down the wires for you. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, I think I think no, Jason, seriously. you're gonna play around with it more for sure. I'm definitely gonna play around with it on my own time because that that sounds great. Um, I think probably we're we're due to make a video about it, right? Or at least put it in documentation a little bit, show show Mender off in, in definitely. the Definitely. Yes. And I definitely uh I'm happy to help with that. I uh, I have already the tutorials for how to set it up on uh the play and the AI on the Mender Hub. So if you are um either looking into Mender or running into problems, which should not be, but of course sometimes happens, uh head over to hub.mender.io. You can find me there because I literally look at all posts and I try to help everybody and vice versa. If you, uh, Andre, Jason, if you would like to have some getting started, some tutorial for uh, beagleboard.org, for the wiki, um, I'm happy to help there to polish it. Um, we can also have a, a nice uh, video walkthrough, whatever works, you just know. Uh, where to find me yeah i mean we'll finish we'll, we'll finish a good setup guide for getting the mender client set up um but i think you know we'll we'll get that extra step further as we go on to actually setting up an ab on a running image right so like resizing the, the partition um reformatting the, the the second you know that so you have an actual ab set up and then getting the live config set up um you know, with whatever the grub script that needs to be there so that we can actually perform a true AB setup. We call Perfect. it Beagle Bulletproof Proof. Beagle Bulletproof Boot. BBB. Exactly. Beagle Play Bulletproof. BPBP. Because that's one of the things that we can finally do, especially with the play of it's in gigs EMMC. It's, you could actually do an AB partition with. A high OS like Debian, whereas with, when we had only four, it's like sure, let's do AB. You could do it, but yeah, you got a very small image. I mean, I mean, um, my Beagle bones don't flash anymore because I still have the two GB version, which is kind of sad. <laughs> well, they still work good in the build farm. They still work. They still work. Can Can I have one final um, politically incorrect question, maybe? Ooh. Oh, definitely. Those are the best. Yes. Those are the best. When do I get a pink Beagle, board, a Beagle Play? You hmm. know I love pink. I want the pink PCB. The, the Barbie edition. The, the Oppenheimer one can be the black one the, already. Oh, <laughs> the, Bar the Barbenheimer edition. That would be lovely. Cut it Cut it down the middle, I mean, you know, so you have half, half, half seriously. green, half white. That, so that is my mobile. I love pink. In discussion too, there's also the everything is better if it's pink. Yeah, I don't know how much you've looked at some of these. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll work on our hues. <laughs> <laughs> so, con con okay, as as uh, as the praise, I have to say that I got some very nice Beagleboard sunglasses at Prague. They're not exactly pink; they're more like screaming orange, but they're yeah. really nice. 
So, <laughs> but, but I mean, practically, the, the the you know the the issue with pink is just the contrast with the silk screen. I mean, just from a super t uh, practical standpoint, right? It, the closer it gets to red, the closer it gets to practical. But I mean, I, I'm just trying to tell you, I'm taking your request seriously. You just gotta find the right <laughs> silk screen color. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> when right. what, what we do is we'll, we'll pull we'll pull some off the production line when they still have the you know some of the masks on for the for the copper and we'll just spray paint them pink you know that that'll be fine. Yeah. Can of Rustolium will do it. Pink because there was the pink board. I want pink good. Good. Perfect. All right. Thanks so much, Yosef. Today was a great episode. See you. See everyone in two <laughs> weeks. And we'll we'll catch Thanks up. Thanks for having it. me. And